Um, hey everyone, thank you for joining today's session. Um, welcome to the last week of our uh, introduction to NLP series. Um, today we have Ruchika Singh with us, who's going to share um, first-hand first insight on her uh, experience in NLP in the industry. Um, this will be followed by a live Q&A, so don't miss out on the opportunity to ask an expert all your uh, career-related uh, and industry-related NLP questions. So before we kickstart today's session, I have some quick announcements and shoutouts to make. Um, so continue your ML journey with us. I know this is the last session of the NLP series, but we have uh, another series coming up for you, which is a introduction to advanced machine learning series. This is a six part technical series introducing some advanced machine learning concepts like uh, which encapsulate unsupervised machine learning problems and techniques to work with unstructured data like text and sequential time series data sets. Um, so Rishika will be sharing the link to register for this series in the chat. Uh, so please do join us for that and we hope um, this series was helpful for you and the upcoming series would be helpful for you too. Um, so shout out to our amazing team of volunteers who put together this series. We would not have the series without them. Some of them are panelists on this webinar. For this session, Ruchika Singh will be the speaker and she'll be coming on shortly. And all the other leaders we present on the chat support you. So feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions that you have. Shout out to our sponsor, Home Depot for putting together much needed events for our community in this, in this, in this crucial time. Uh, do show your appreciation for them by retweeting our post uh, on Twitter. Uh, Rishika has uh, shared the link in the chat. And lastly, before we begin, um, you can access the slides um, and download them. Uh, the link will be shared in the chat. Um, if you have any questions during the series, uh, during the uh, session that is industry or career related that you would like to ask Ruchika, please post them in the Q&A box. If you see any questions that you'd like to know the answer to, please upload them so that we know that they're popular questions that um, will bubble up to Ruchika to answer. And if you face any issues during the session, feel free to use the chat to reach out to any of us uh, panelists and we'd be happy to help uh, debug what the issue is and figure out what's going on. So without further ado, um, let's begin. I'm going to pass it on to Ruchika so that she can share with us her experience um, in this session. Welcome Ruchika. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, let me quickly share my screen with you all. Okay, great. So um, very excited to speak with everyone here today. Uh, just a quick introduction of who I am. Uh, my name is Ruchika and uh, I have been uh, working in the data science industry broadly for the longest time now, almost a decade. Uh, I started my career in different jobs doing, uh, you know, hardcore structured data analytics, um, marketing analytics, marketing science. I spent a lot of time with uh, Ogilvy. It's a big advertising agency uh, here in New York and uh, I led some of their New York uh, analytics teams here. And within my time there, I've spent a lot of time working in the space of NLP as it has evolved. Uh, obviously it's still not very evolved in terms of there's a long way to go, but uh, I have seen how it started, you know, times when we were doing text mining in SPSS, uh, though I don't look so old, but I've, I've gone through that uh, whole transition uh, to now when we are having like spacey IRL events and you know doing learning so much every day and how this uh, field is evolving. Um, so happy to speak about you. How do you, how do you understand the opportunity? Uh, what, is, uh, what does it mean to build a career in the space of uh, machine learning, NLP, data science? And how, how do you make, how do you put your best foot forward? So this is very much a discussion on how do you do that uh, more than the technical aspects of it. Uh, obviously you have had a rigorous last four weeks. Uh, so I'm so excited uh, that we get an opportunity to talk of the, about the other side that 
you know, despite knowing everything, uh, learning all the codes and, you know, building on the models, uh, what else is in there? How is the industry using it? What are the differences? How do people, how to manage uh, expectations, all that stuff. So what's the broad agenda? We are going to do a quick recap of the acronyms because I, uh, while building this deck, I decided to go through all of the decks before and I realized that there are so many acronyms and uh, if somebody, some of you who may, who may know a lot about it from before or it may also be uh, very new to you. So it is important to just keep the perspective on where does NLP sit in the landscape of AI, machine learning, you know, and all that good stuff. Uh, how do we, apply it in the industry. So there's, there are different applications at different stages of product life cycles, of marketing, of customer service. Um, and how do you apply NLP? What are some of the interesting use cases based on different industries? You will see a flavor of, uh, I have tried to touch different industries, but obviously I, I can talk a lot more freely and uh, robustly about uh, the applications in the world of marketing and advertising. Then NLP in social media. So right now I'm with Facebook and I'm in their marketing science team. And uh, I, I just find it fascinating how the platform uses so much of NLP every day, uh, much to, you know, we don't even know what's going on every day, but there's so much engineering involved, but that I'll give you a glimpse of what's, what's out there. How do, how does big social media tech companies leverage NLP today? And the last, but the most important piece is, you know, as you begin your careers in NLP, as you begin your careers in machine learning, like I always see this as a part of your toolkit, like you're not going to be like an NLP expert unless you're going into deep learning and, you know, becoming a true um, machine learning engineer. But if you kind of touch things about NLP and build your career in the broader machine learning, uh, data science, AI perspective, how do you go about it? There are experts who have spoken at length about it. And some of my thoughts here would be, you know, just referring to how people who have done really well in the field have tackled it uh, in the very beginning, because it's not just about knowing the tools and the technology, but it is also about how do you work cross-functionally and how do you make your work most impactful. So let's start with the recap. Um, in terms of big things, artificial intelligence, what is it? Is it, uh, it's, it's the broad discipline of creating intelligent machines. It entails a lot of uh, a programming, it entails a lot of uh, machine learning, but it's just the broadest, broader discipline where people are trying to replicate the human brain, how the human brain reacts, how do we encode information and then process it and predict stuff and then decode it. Now that happens uh, in, in sentient human beings very easily, but how do we do that in machines is, is really AI. And it is a big broad spectrum, um, which, which entails a lot of things. Um, but when you go a little narrower, uh, there is obviously a lot happening in the machine learning field. Now machine learning is about how do we train systems from past experience and how do we make them to predict and react to it. And that entails everything when it comes to modeling, when it comes to, um, you know, building, training your data sets and predicting and auto predicting and fine tuning. Uh, so all of that is machine learning. Deep learning is also a kind of machine learning, but it refers to the systems that end to that end learn to and uh, that learn end to end. So you learn from the experience on large data sets. Uh, you see a lot of deep learning in um, you know, speech recognition, image recognition, but now uh, deep learning is coming uh, very close and a lot has, is seen in NLP. And then you have uh, artificial neural networks. It refers to how uh, we model human neural network uh, that and replicated in how computers learn. So that's, uh, that's just uh, ANN. Then you have natural language processing, which kind of just sits somewhere in the middle um, to understand the human language and to process it and to derive meaning out of it. Now, if you know the language and if you're human, you can do it, but how do machines learn that information and do something with it? That's, uh, that's really the broadest piece of NLP that you all are very interested in and doing this webinar. And then the last one, and there's, there's many more, but you also have automated speech recognition where you're trying to do speech to text uh, APIs and you're trying to use uh, voice assistants like Google and Alexa. So that's again, another speed, another area of work, but that again has a lot of implications in leveraging uh, NLP. 
So if you kind of put everything in an ecosystem, uh, how will it look like? So you have a big, broad Venn diagram uh, where AI is the bigger circle and then machine learning and deep learning kind of sit within it. Deep learning, it is an aspect of machine learning because now you're dealing with large data sets and trying to do um, more robust end-to-end -end learning. And then you have speech recognition, NLP. I did not put image, but I think image recognition also kind of just sits somewhere in between. So just when you think about talking about it or trying to explore about what kind of jobs you want to do, you need to put things in perspective and say that where do I want to go very deep in and how much in it, how much coverage I want to make in terms of what do I know. So you, you can be an NLP expert, you can be a machine learning expert, or you can also be both of these. So it really just depends on what you want to do. So that's how I, I think about it as, uh, as we think about our evolving careers. Now, beyond that, you will also see um, words like modeling, which I don't think I need to go into it, but it's just like an, a, a way we talk about before machine learning became a concept, advanced analytics people uh, used to call it modeling and advanced analytics where we are training data and then we are outputting the process and that's the model. But now we do it much more algorithmically. You, we train multiple models, we build models over models and everything can be done through, uh, you know, or through a piece of code uh, when a data scientist is, an analytics, an analytics person is not sitting and doing this uh, repeatedly over his machine. We talked a lot about NLP, so I'm just gonna skip that. And then computer vision is just enabling machines to analyze, um, understand and manipulate images and video. So it is really important because as the modalities of communication change, we need to, build new tools and techniques and methodologies to learn what they are communicating. So when it is, when everything was recorded just as, uh, as data, uh, which is like numerical data, then we only needed to know how to do deal, deal with databases and how to do data analysis on big data sets. Uh, and that's when that was super important and still super important because in the world, all the transactions still are counted as numerics. But as the, the mode of communication on the internet has increased so much towards language and towards writing and towards posting and reviewing, we shifted a lot of focus on NLP because we want to understand what people are trying to say and uh, what kind of information we can derive out of it. And the last piece is now, if you go to your social media feeds, there is only video. There's short form video, there are reels and you know there's long form video, there's just video is the king today of communication. So how do we now understand video um, is, so there is, there's a company called Vidmob. If you, if you want to go and check out, they do a lot of like video analytics. So that's, that's about computer vision. So those are, uh, you know, those are all of the different kinds of definitions you need to keep in mind. And as, as you go deeper into machine learning itself, uh, these are very, um, very popular and common ways of defining what is supervised learning in the area of machine learning and what is unsupervised learning. Uh, for example, you guys did a model on logistic regression. Uh, you, what is it? It's supervised learning. Uh, why is it supervised learning? Because it's, uh, it's the way you tell the computer or tell the code that there, is, there are two things I want to predict, uh, you know, zero or one. And now the machine is learning that how can I predict zero better and how can I predict one better? So you are supervising in terms of giving them a guardrail of what you're trying to find out. Unsupervised is when you do not have a guardrail, when you tell the machine, here's a piece of data now, or here you tell, you tell your package. Uh, let's not say machine makes me think of robots. Uh, so you, you write a code and you think of what patterns are emerging in the data without me telling anything about it. So if I have uh, you know, 25 surveys from different customers and I'm trying to understand what did they write in those open-ended answers, I would like to do it without giving them any labels or without giving them any qualifiers to say what are the common themes. So a good way of thinking about unsupervised learning is clustering of uh, customer reviews or topic modeling. Those are very common unsupervised learning examples or just looking at customer behavior data and trying to uh, learn from that uh, to say there are different kinds of cohorts existing. So that's unsupervised learning. 
Transfer learning is again another new area of research in machine learning, and it focuses on understanding and gaining knowledge from the past, uh, from one problem and applying it to a different problem. So you're kind of, there is a, there's an idea of learning something and helping it predicts a different or related problem. So you're connecting different um, problems versus just connecting different data sets. And that also reduces the need for additional training data and compute because what you could have learned from the adult model uh, with a related data set, you can apply to uh, apply to this new one. So really there's just a lot and I wanted to spend the time for you all to reflect and think about how do you, how do you put this maze together? Because NLP is obviously a part of it and but you need to understand the broader universe. So that's, um, that's just a recap. Any questions, feel free to uh, put it in the chat or in the Q&A panel and uh, people can help you answer it. Now let's quickly move on to um, NLP in the industry. Um, and in, when I say industry, it can be anything. It can be banking, it can be marketing, it can be CRM, um, it can be the finance, the, the hedge fund. So NLP is being used everywhere. And uh, let's see how it is being used. So in a nutshell, the way I really explain it to my clients or to my partners is to say that you are taking human language and you're processing it in a way that it uh, it gives you non-trivial useful output. So if I take a bunch of text and I process it, I analyze it, forget about machines, I do it myself. I try and take 20 posts and try and read it. And uh, I classify into say that this, this, this piece of text is talking about um, these three um, areas. It is talking about, uh, you know, product features. It is talking about how product is helping in my daily life. And it is talking about how can the product be made better. Now that's non-trivial because I'm not just counting words and I'm not telling you that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not just making a regular word cloud. Now word cloud is also a kind of entity, but it's non-trivial because it means something. And so that's, that's the intelligent process that is NLP. And why do, I, why do I need it? Because there is just so much off text in the world. Uh, if I think about the world today, we are creating four, uh, half a million tweets per minute. We are creating half a million posts per minute. We are searching so much. We are searching almost two and a half million searches are happening per minute. And we are sending text and we are doing emails and it just gives you the volume of information that's just floating around in the world and on the internet. And that's how uh, we are building new companies, we are improving businesses, we are serving customers, uh, we are trying to solve medical diseases, trying to you know, tackle with the pandemic. How are we doing all this? I mean, we are only doing it because we can process that information. And that is really the need for NLP. Now, NLP is not new. Uh, you know, research on documents has existed for the longest time ever. So I also wanted to give you guys perspective that when you come to an interview or when you're talking to your uh, you know, experienced colleagues or new colleagues, you need to understand where, um, where and how NLP has evolved. So I, 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 I took this from a YouTube um, video by this person. He's a, he's a really ex renowned expert, uh, Yao Goldberg, on how machine learning has evolved over time. So if you think about the 1950s to the 1990s, uh, basically people were just building rules based on text, based on phrases, based on content, which was uh, you know, textual in nature. And that's, that's rule-based systems. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen today, but that was the, everything that happened at that time. Then you came up with like, you know, corpuses, like, okay, now I'm gonna take these hundreds of corp uh, documents and I will read through them or I will uh, analyze these and I will do text mining on it. And those are corpus-based statistics. So you are talking about uh, you know, your TDFs, uh, your frequency distributions, all that stuff. Then came machine learning, where we are now, we are, we are kind of in the phase where we are trying to predict, we are trying to classify text, we are trying to pre predict missing text, um, we are trying to identify common themes from text. So that is all uh, in the realm of machine learning. So we are really, diff evolving the way we apply um, maths and stats and technology to date to textual data and that's really what's happening and now we are in the space of deep learning where we we want them to learn 
all by themselves we want to if we want to have like millions and millions of documents or pages being read through it and trying to find patterns and trying to predict patterns out of it but as we have evolved from you know knowing very little or working with very few data sets to working with a gazillion data sets we have also noticed that the, the whole process has become very uh, black boxy because now when you run a piece of code or when you try and do the do the model you don't know much you just you just get the output and if you if you try and explain it to an end user or a business stakeholder it is very difficult because you are, you cannot explain what really happened to a to a lay person and that really is the challenge that i feel is with nlp today or deep learning today like the outputs when they are being used in in the product itself where i'm taking data and i'm learning on it and then i'm building features out of it that's fine but when i'm bringing it to the end audience um it is kind of a challenge because in order to ma maximize the benefit of anything related to um data you you need you you need to be able to explain it in simple terms and um, i think that's the next part where we we give the ownership back to the data scientists to the uh, to the engineers where it's not so black box anymore i i do have a base model but now we can you know we can decode it improve it uh, uh fine tune it if when we get to that balance i i i strongly believe that that will really like open up nlp and the and the way it's applied across the industry in small and big pieces because that's what people want the people want the power of being able to interpret it and improve it and uh, especially when it comes to business now but one thing to note is uh, you know how is it being used in the industry uh, are we all deep learning are we all machine learning as businesses and as companies um, not really you'll see in few few slides down is we probably are doing a little bit of it and as you know all the all the googles and the apples and the microsoft there's happening much but if you go beyond because the industry is much beyond than much bigger than the just the six uh, big uh, tech companies not all the deep learning is happening and a lot of people are still using rule based systems and i think it's very important to understand that your nlp journey doesn't mean you have to be a deep learning expert and that's that's really the point of this uh, this slide now why uh, why do i feel like human language is so special and why does everybody spend so much time uh, continuously evolving and building a nlp because uh, it's it's special it's not like data it is not like numbers uh, it is not a signal that we can you know predict so easily it's not it's not like uh, it's not like weather that something happens a happens and then b happens people talk people write and it is deliberate people are thinking about it and writing uh, it also uses encodings that little kids can learn so it's kind of complex um it's discrete it's many languages are there uh, they are categorical and uh, it is layered with sound images and gestures uh, the, the the biggest challenge when you try and model something out or predict something out is uh, is the fact that it is not contextual like there is no a prior to it but when i am speaking something i have a context and i am also using other modalities like image like the way i talk the how i express myself or the pictures i am using like if you if you try and take this webinar and you try and do a an nlp uh, out uh, build an nlp model of what we speak about it will be so different because there is so much that is going on in the powerpoint presentation i am doing or the way i am talking to you in terms of how i am modulating my voice and the kind of hand gestures i am using so that is that is what makes human language so difficult to codify and when when you talk to different people different kinds of stakeholders you will in, you will come across people who do not get this who do not understand the inherent biases in human language that makes it such a difficult uh, aspect so you know this is uh, this is not really about you know i'm not trying to say that what what you do is not accurate or not good but there is just so much context that you need to be aware as a as a data scientist when you're doing it so that you can effectively communicate and make other people benefit out of it
So what, what's driving the growth of NLP? Uh, we talked about why is it important and how complex it is. But the reason why NLP has become so important is, is the fact that the data is growing so fast. We have so much data, we have so much computing power, and now we have, uh, you know, with, uh, with new, uh, new languages and new algorithms, we can build very, very sophisticated models, which would have taken, A, which would have not been possible because there was not enough data, and B, there was just not enough computing power for the machine to compute these models. But now all of that statistical concepts have been able to manifest themselves into models and algorithms because of the computing power. So these three things, when they are combined, is it's, uh, you know, NLP is poised to grow. There is just no way that we are going to stop growing this as an industry and as a domain, just because the nature of how the foundations are and the fact that the more we use our mobile phones, the more we use internet, the more natural language is gonna be out there as data. And the, the structured data is gonna gradually, I think, it is going to shrink because we we can you know we we don't even want to write emails anymore people are like let's just do chatbots in future so there is just so much opportunity for nlp so what do we think of nlp i see them as uh, and you know i i've been i i attended a bunch of spacey irl videos i looked at them while preparing for it and also in uh, just when it happened in 20 uh, in the last year or so you will see that there are two bespoke ways NLP is addressed, like NLP in research and academics, which is extremely advanced and very fan, fine tuned. Uh, you know, they're using models that are predicting their, their end to end systems, it's using lots of data. Um, but when you come to the industry, I feel uh, it's still very basic, like especially when I think of the customer service industry and marketing, and you know, finance, people are still using a lot of n-grams, a lot of uh, topic models, TF-IDF, and people are using a lot of regular expressions. Not to say that it's bad, but um, I think as a data scientist, everybody's very ambitious. Uh, you know, when we get into the industry, it's like, oh, I'm gonna build the best deep learning uh, thing out there. Uh, I'm gonna build uh, multiple predictive models on my data, but not really. You, you have to understand um, that people are still very far behind in the journey of adopting unstructured information. People are used to uh, working with tabular data, which is structured and quantifiable. There are very little gray pieces. Um, so even things like, you know, predicting sentiment, even though sentiment prediction has been there for so long, um, it's people do not really trust it because every sentiment prediction model, are, you know, they, they have become much better now, but just two, three years back, like the accuracy of even um, sentiment prediction in, in tools uh, would be around 60 to 65%. So that is why um, I think it's important to know that there's a big gap in what we think we are doing uh, and what we are actually doing. And I'm talking about the industry as large. There, obviously there are tech companies who are doing like way advanced stuff uh, as they build their products and platforms, deep learning is core to them, but not everybody is going to do that. And uh, there is just uh, a lot, lot out there outside of it. So what are some of the missing elements as people say, and I think I really recommend you guys watching this uh, YouTube video. It's a really uh, fascinating one on how he talks about uh, his own work and uh, how, how He's, he, they have solved some of the problems and they haven't. So some of the elements that are really missing in terms of NLP is bridging. So, you know, when, when you are trying to make a connection between two pieces of text, um, the end-to-end the, the -end systems today, do, they, they don't get it right because they do not have the context. And it's just really very difficult for a machine to predict that context. And, uh, you know, also in terms of missing subjects, like when we use words, what is the, what is it being used as a subject for is a, another big missing piece in terms of uh, text, because um, it's the reason why it happens is because there is so much bias and context, but some of those big pieces still need to be solved for. And, uh, and the last one is really that it is a one shot model syndrome. We build, we build, we build one model and then we just plug it in and push and play. But NLP needs to be a process. Uh, I think there is a, 
there's a company called prodigy.ai and uh, they are trying to make this like uh, sell this idea of how can you like fine tune and make nlp process oriented so i think there's a lot of work to be done there so i highly recommend watching this uh, content and just generally watching spacey irl if you all are really interested in nlp uh, there's a lot of good stuff uh, out there so we we talked about uh, that is a big opportunity. There's so much data, there's so much computing power, but uh, what is really the, uh, the size? Uh, it's expected to be around $22.3 billion by 2025. And NLP with AI has grown multifold in the last five years. Today, I think the NLP market itself is supposed to be around $5.4 billion, uh, which is huge, uh, you know, because it is such a niche area of research, such a niche and very new area of work. Um, when when I was, uh, you know, I, I used to work with IBM in 2014 and uh, NLP was still, you know, very nascent at that time. And from there to now in five years, uh, we have seen a huge growth. So, you know, I'm, uh, I, I think the big thing is you guys are doing this and you should be invested in it because there are very, uh, very few experts out there who know a lot about NLP. So there are a lot of deep experts, but then it has not become a, a data science social topic as you know i would say regression is today last few years has been very big for nlp not from just research perspective but also from talent perspective um, and how companies are investing in it um, gafam as they are commonly called google uh, apple facebook microsoft uh, amazon uh, they have acquired 60 ai startups since 2010 now that's that's a lot. If you think about it, it's just been nine, nine years and uh, there are five companies. Uh, so having 60 AIs, uh, AI companies just start up because AI is still just a piece of what they do. Um, uh, that goes to show how, how big this is uh, for the world today. Um, reading machines are improving and poly proliferating in terms of NLP being successful. Uh, this is, you know, some kind of a prediction that tells you that there are thousand analysts and the information that they need to process the financial analyst uh, is in the order of zettabytes. So 10 to the power of 21 versus 10 to the power of three. So imagine thousand analysts sitting and trying to analyze all of the financial data which is unstructured and they're reading through it uh, in order to do that effectively they will um, they will need the support of machines they will need the support of nlp and that's what exactly what's happening we see a lot of that being used uh, in the financial industry and you know just the fact that so much text data is available and it it is growing faster than the amount of human analysts we have. It is in itself creating an opportunity for startups to build new NLP tools uh, because it's not just one, uh, one industry that we need NLP, whether I told you like you can, you can take manufacturing, medical, healthcare, CRM, uh, marketing, finance, insurance, everybody needs to analyze text data and make meaning out of it. So th this industry is bound to grow. So let's look at some of uh, some of the interesting examples. I know um, you know the team shared a lot of ex examples with you all in the first uh, in the first session, but there are some interesting ones that caught my eye as well. So there is this company called Primer. Um, I think it's uh, it's a startup. They were able to find forty thousand scientists who were missing from Wikipedia, but had similar level levels of news coverage to scientists listed on Wikipedia. Now, what does that mean? So we we have Wikipedia and uh, Everybody who can go want to, wants to write a, an entry on Wikipedia, people can go and write an entry on Wikipedia. But humans, you know, human eye and the, the human population can miss information. So these guys came up with a way of writing or in making new entries about 40,000 people who are not on Wikipedia uh, using the data and using NLP. So I think that's really fascinating. Like I always imagine that, oh, every Wikipedia entry is just, you know, written by somebody or uh, curated by some human being, but that's not true. The other uh, very close to all, you know, mostly, uh, most, I, I think the majority of the customer base for uh, Stitch Fix is women. 
so I can safely say that it's uh, females would be super interested in knowing this, um, that they use they use NLP to understand what kind of content people are liking. Now, if you have used Stitch Fix, uh, when you first sign up for this, um, for this uh, service, you basically give them your preferences that what kind of jeans do I want? What kind of, uh, you know, top shirts do I want? What's my size? What's my, uh, what kind of a physique I have? Uh, what kind of a style I'm into? And all of that is really just Q and A based. So it's really human language. And then, uh, you know, they're, they, they're not a million stylists sitting at Stitch Fix service centers and, you know, talking one-on-one. -on -one. This is obviously happening through machines. So they take all of this information, they build a model to predict what kind of, uh, you know, what, what department will I want to shop in, whether I want to buy a shoe, whether I want to buy a jeans or uh, outerwear, uh, what kind of design do I like, what kind of stylist am I into? So this is really fascinating. Like we would not have thought this, uh, you know, a decade back, that we will actually be able to shop what I want to shop without ever going to the store, uh, without ever filling up a big uh, 100 page form about what, what do I need. I'm just talking to um, a chat a chat service and I'm getting what I need. This one, um, I, I found this uh, to be amazing. It's not really just uh, a NLP, but these people are trying to build, uh, and it's, it's somewhere in East Europe, that they're trying to machine translate ASL so that people who cannot understand ASL can understand ASL better. And uh, it's for the deaf community to be more heard. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a topic which is really close to a lot of people, but uh, you would, and you would imagine that there's like tons of research happening in this field, but this again is a good, a very, very relevant example of NLP um, on how we can make uh, people with disabilities uh, benefit from this. So I think again, you guys should go and look at some of the videos. There is another video listed here on how what sign all is doing. And you know, I haven't got in, gotten into the depth of how they, what technology and techniques they're using. Uh, but again, a very, very uh, philanthropic, a very uh, thoughtful uh, application of NLP. And then voice assistance. I think this is something that we all are very close to. So, you know, apart from giving interesting examples, uh, obviously there is Google search, which is like the bread and butter of NLP. We cannot in search the internet if there was no NLP. Uh, there is Google, there is Siri. Uh, so all of the voice assistants are using so much NLP. Uh, when it comes to Amazon, you see a gazillion reviews every day and you write reviews and you read reviews. Now there are companies that are, you know, that have built their businesses out of doing NLP on those reviews, uh, whether it is comes to predicting the right product features and working with product research teams, or it is thinking about competitive benchmarking in terms of what are people telling about brand A versus brand B um, in terms of pricing analytics. So what features, uh, so that's a combination of how do you use uh, structured plus unstructured. So how, how the review content is affecting the rating and eventually the pricing of the products on Amazon or any other e-commerce site. So again, like when you think of general commercial application, like the text data in terms of Google, uh, in terms of Amazon reviews, in terms of social media um, con conversations, those are some of the biggest, biggest applications of how NLP is being applied to uh, the field I'm close to, which is not me. Some of the work that I have personally done, which I think is uh, very interesting uh, when it comes to NLP is, uh, you know, at, at one point we were trying to do, uh, to understand that how does the conversation on a social media uh, map against the, the kind of keyword searches that are happening on Google. So you are you are essentially looking at Google keyword searches around certain topics. And then you are looking at uh, social media conversations around uh, like comments and, uh, you know, blogs around that. And you're trying to understand how, uh, how they map. And why is it important? Because uh, even though they are all text related communication uh, platforms, the way Google is established uh, in, in the mind of the customer is it's a, it's, it's a demand 
space where I know what I want. So I have very high intent to buy something. So I go and search for something. Whereas when I'm discovering something or I'm like looking for something or I'm trying to research on a topic, then I'm using uh, other social networks uh, where I'm trying to read how people have uh, what, how people have spoken about it. So really you are trying to make a supply versus demand of topics and content when you're looking at uh, conversations happening on social media versus conversations or keywords that are being used in Google. And you'll, you will see a, a clear pattern that there are some, some things for which, which people research a lot uh, on social media and there are some topics which people do not research. So that kind of you know, combination is also a very interesting aspect where you're applying your business skills, you're applying your NLP skills, and you're also applying your, uh, uh, your data skills to say that how can I take this information, put it in combination with structured information and make meaning out of it. Okay, so let's quickly uh, go through NLP and social media. We started talking about it in terms of what, how we can use NLP and how is NLP being used in social media. But I think because I work at Facebook, I think it's it's good to talk about it. I'm, I don't work in uh, their uh, NLP team or engineering team. I'm, uh, I work in the marketing science uh, team, but I think it is as a customer, as a social media user, all of us have seen multilingual news feeds. Uh, you know, I have friends from at least 20 different countries living in New York. You meet uh, a lot of diverse people. So language processing becomes the core of a lot of what you see on the feed because now you are expected uh, to understand what somebody is posting. A, if in another language, then it gets machine translated using NLP. Uh, or if they are speaking in English, but they there is the style is really different because even English speaking nations have a, a different uh, way they they form their sentences. So if you think about having a consistent experience where every user is understanding what is happening in their feed properly, then there is like deep levels of NLP going on in the platform for that experience. And I think that that's the core of NLP, how we uh, how we have seen used it as social media platform companies. So one interesting example is the, the you know, natural language search. So instead of always putting your filters, uh, you can actually just go and filter for phrases like friends from London or friends interested in uh, uh, NLP. So that's, that's, that's a very common thing. And I think there was a specific product built out to be able to do that on Facebook. And then uh, just one more note. So you will not find these slides in the PDF that um, we share because, you know, specifically there are there are some rules on what we can share, what we can share. So I really cannot share uh, Facebook related information out. So this is even though this is just from my personal experience, these couple of slides are uh, out of uh, this PDF that we sent. Now, uh, machine translation, we talked about it. This is a friend who is French and she's, a, she's one of my closest friends, but I would have never understood what she puts on her feed if there was no machine translation. So connecting with friends who don't speak my language, I think is a big, big, big thing we see on uh, social media. Then the social, like the end, the nonprofit aspect of it. So one interesting and, uh, you know, one very cool aspect of what happens at Facebook is we use, uh, the, the text is used to understand if people are in need of blood or they are trying to donate blood and then they are you know made to connect with these blood donation drives now this would not have been possible if we were not doing this through nlp and it doesn't just use like it's not only in english but it actually you, you know the language that i speak like it also happens in hindi so uh, this this really understanding the intent of a given po post and give the people the best experience in their intent is uh, is really interesting, and the fact that it is being used for uh, expanding the blood donation um, drive, uh, I find it I find it awesome. Like one of the reasons why I think the, the the social media platforms are pretty amazing that while they also do a lot of advertising and a lot of business related stuff, this kind of stuff uh, leverages from the technology and the deep learning that they do.
Now we have the marketplace uh, where people are trying to buy and sell things. Now, obviously, everybody is writing in text in their post about what they want to sell, what they want to buy, how much do they want to pay for it. So again, this is another way of uh, helping communities engage and transact within themselves uh, using NLP. You would have, I'm sure most of you have seen recommendations in terms of messenger when you are engaging with people or engaging with brands, there are some kind of auto prompts and that also leverages a lot of NLP. So uh, just to say that there's just so much application. Uh, obviously, there are some very, very uh, simple applications like interest-based targeting for advertising, where I'm trying to understand what people are interested in based on the brands they follow or the posts they like. So there is there is another an aspect of NLP. But beyond that, just in terms of using the platform and you know making experience for the platform seamless and personal and useful, uh, NLP is so critical. So it's a huge growth opportunity for businesses, for companies like Facebook and um, Twitter, uh, and for analysts who want to want to work in it. So uh, we talked a lot about what's good, what's the opportunity, why why is it big? But there are some challenges when we deal with inconsistencies in language, when uh, while processing it algorithmically. You have to deal with slangs, you have to deal with typos, you have to deal with idioms. Um, and, you know, you can go on the internet and find like a paper on each that how did somebody understand poetic language? How did somebody use NLP in the context of many idioms in the document? So there's just so much research and you could do a, you know, you could literally just do a PhD on one of these topics. So that again says that there is just so much inconsistency that needs to be solved and the, the, the vastness of inconsistency because of the way there are so many languages and people speak uh, gives you an opportunity to solve a very small problem in a very big world and still make an impact. Now context, we talked about multimodality. I think in the, in the, in the, especially in the world of social media comms where people write shorter sentences, use a lot of videos and text, uh, language processing is very different from, you know, when you're doing language processing in a well-documented clinical trial research paper. And how do we, how do we solve for that is another big area of research and uh, application, I feel, uh, for upcoming NLP um, engineers or machine learning uh, scientists. Then morphology, like, you know, in, in every language you have, uh, you have the ability to make new words using suffixes and prefixes, and it is not consistent across every language. So for example, if you, um, you know, traditional systems uh, learn based on the concept of a word. So, but there are for some languages, the, the, the size of the vocabulary is huge because you can keep generating new words, uh, such as German and Finnish. Um, and Turkish is also one of those languages where each suffix creates a new valid word. So if, you know, some of you may be uh, from Turkey in this, uh, in this webinar, and uh, that, that kind of variation is very impossible to predict and learn when you're working with the training data. So I think that's, again, makes learning on languages, especially some languages, makes it very difficult. And when and it is required every day. Like, I think this is just the biggest application, like translation, uh, whether it is on Facebook or Google is the biggest applications of NLP, uh, if you think about it. Okay, so I know we have uh, 15 to 20, 25 minutes now. So I would love to talk about, you know, now that you, you know that it is something that you really want to dive deep into, it's very close to your heart. Uh, how do you navigate your NLP career? How do you make the best out of it? Because everybody is at a different stage in terms of their career journeys. I think, uh, you know, you'll see a few slides um, about being in a job. So imagine uh, hypothetically that you are an NLP expert, you're working in a business, uh, in a company, and people are coming to you to solve different kinds of problems. Uh, and everybody wants to use NLP because it's just a new thing, right? Like now we, we are all beyond building uh, regular models and using uh, st 
statistical concepts. Now I want to do NLP. I want to be the best. So you will meet different kinds of people with, who come from different places. And, uh, you know, I have just tried to show you the different personas that exist. And it's not, you know, I didn't create them, but I found them as super interesting. So I thought I'd include this in the presentation. So there is this person called Anodyne Andy. Uh, you know, he doesn't know the problem. He doesn't know what he's solving for. He just thinks that NLP could solve it. So in this case, you know, you don't need to go deep into uh, the work with this kind of person. You're just going to make sure you give them the right NLP examples. You give them the context, like where is NLP useful? And, you know, maybe try and talk to them about assessing what kind of data do they have. So every problem doesn't mean you need to make an NLP model or you need to use a start, uh, start doing deep learning. Uh, the people have no idea what they're asking. Some of them will be like this and they probably are just good with getting some NLP examples. Now, this is one kind of people you're going to deal with. Um, you know, another, uh, another kind of stakeholders are people like Easy Eds. Uh, so I, I, I really find the names funny. So Easy Eds are, they, they're actually trying to solve for something else, but they believe that uh, NLP is the solution. So they, for example, somebody can come to you with like 20 different PDFs and they'll be coming to you to say that, hey, I want a, a solution to get all of this data into, uh, into tables. Now that's not an NLP problem. This is a problem of getting PDFs in a database. So you could help them uh, through simple solutions which, which does data collection, data management. So that's, that's another kind. And I think we have seen a lot of them like this uh, that happen uh, because remember like every stakeholder you are working with can be in a different part of the job uh, somebody is you know only wanting to sell pitches to a client so they are looking for cool things somebody is trying to solve a very tactical problem of getting data into a database so they are trying to solve for uh, something like this so you need to know as and, and data scientists and analytics teams uh, you know broadly in companies uh, are mostly divided by departments. But if you're working in a small company, you kind of are like just this catch all for anything related to data and machine learning. So sometimes you'll, you'll have these issues. And I'm sure some of you have faced this before. Now, show off Sarah, uh, I, I just do not like the fact that whoever built these slides thinks that, you know, show off Sarah has to be called Sarah and has to be a female. But, uh, you know, unfortunately it is how it is. Uh, so. Show of Sarah wants to do AI. She needs to just show something that, hey, we, we, are, we are, for example, you know, she may be a marketer and she may want to like say that, hey, I want to build this cool marketing idea using AI, uh, which may not be at all possible. So you need to do expectation management. You need to tell, okay, here's what's possible. Here's what's not possible. So just give them real NLP examples. And also, you know, just giving them what is AI? What is NLP? What is machine learning? Because remember, this these things are our day-to-day -day bread and butter, but um, it's not possible that everybody in the industry knows. Everybody kind of just calls it either machine learning or AI, um, or they can also just think that AI are robots. So you have, you are, you know, we are the ambassadors of telling them what is the right thing to do and what is the right thing to look at. Now, there, there are some people who have structured data. So they, they have information in tables, uh, numbers, but they are looking for supplemental uh, information uh, through text data. So, you know, you are then supporting them through some kind of supplemental analysis. So that's another aspect of doing NLP in combination with structured information. Um, there are a lot of people who come with like labeled data that, uh, you know, I have labeled it uh, into these four buckets and now I want to predict how, how I want to do labeling. How, how can I predict these labels? So then, you know, again, this person probably needs uh, some more NLP and machine learning examples of how to do it and how can we go about it. But they may, they may just have like, you know, very little data or just the labels with very little like, you know, features. So what are we predicting? How are we doing? They may not have anything. And, you know, then there are some people who actually will have the data, which is prepared, understands the context and how and when to use NLP. Uh, that's the kind of person you want to work with. And I know that, you know, for it's, it, it kind of looks funny, but this is the reality that you have to navigate through different kinds of personalities and stakeholders when you are 
when you are the resident knowledge holder of something so complicated that people don't understand. So you need to really like define the guardrails of what you are very good at, what you can do uh, uh, from your tools and toolkits. So if you are an NLP expert, what is your realm of NLP and what is the problem you're trying to solve? So if you don't establish that for yourself, you know, you can be running Helter Skelter in an organization. And I think the, the fact that machine learning projects are very unique, uh, you know, it's an idea of setting expectations because you don't know what you're going to get eventually. Um, they, they, you can, in the beginning, as, assume that your machine learning model is going to do A, B, C. And at the end of the day, because of the way the data works, because of the way the findings were, it will not work itself out. So you have to establish the idea of being experimental, that we are testing, we are trying, we are learning. It can give you what you expected or it cannot give you what, it may not give you what you really wanted in the beginning. So setting expectations, kind of, you know, a job of a data scientist in a non-data scientific world sometimes is to simplify and manage expectations around your key stakeholders. And that's what makes your project successful. Whether it is NLP or non-NLP, uh, I think it is super important to, for a data professional, most the big universe is data professionals. And when you come to NLP even more because it's even newer and more complex as a topic that you need to simplify and understand what you are really solving for. So I, I often, um, you know, I often think of problems when they come to our teams and, um, you know, in the past or even now is try and understand more than the, the technique that you want to focus on that the problem you're trying to solve for your end user, um, whether you are trying to save their time, whether you are unlocking new features in a data set, where, whether you are predicting something that they will use for optimization. So, um, you know, you really need to focus on what problem are you really trying to solve more than, oh, I'm going to do, um, you know, word to vec or ngram. So that's because our minds are designed to solve a problem from a data perspective. But that's what makes us, you know, very far away from senior uh, decision making. Uh, you know, or that creates the divide between the basement and the boardroom, as I commonly call it, because you do not want to be stuck in the basement building models. There's some of you may be, but uh, you know, because that's what drives uh, excitement and happiness. But some of you may want to be very closer to business, and if you do then you need to really solve for this incremental value piece every time you think about a project that is uh, encompassing something as uh, unique and complex as NLP. So I think we talked about it, like one of the common ML examples is like combining structured and unstructured data. Like one of the projects that is very common on Kaggle actually, if you guys wanna give it a try, is uh, building a machine learning uh, model to predict the listing prices for Airbnb. And there are data sets without the text data and there are data sets with the text, text data. So how can NLP help improve the predictive power of the model is, is the NLP question you're trying to solve. But really um, the incremental value piece that we were talking about is the fact that if you look at Airbnb listings at large as a, as a customer, or as a business is the fact that it is priced high or low is not just a combination of whether it is a you know shared space or a private space or which neighborhood is it in or um, you know what amenities they offer there are obviously those features that predict the price of the listing but also the fact that how do people like it what uh, what what are the reviews telling you what is the description of the listing because if the description is good then the, the, the owner can demand a higher price and people are ready to pay a higher price. So just the fact that adding uh, text analysis or NLP in, uh, into your feature engineering for this machine learning model will add incremental value because it will drastically improve the accuracy of your model. Because if, you know, if, uh, if your RMSE is uh, X, and if NLP adds so much to your model, then it's great. Then you are wanting to use NLP, but just for the heck of using it, even though the fact that, you know, it's uh, it's a business where the, the reviews don't matter, um, like, you know, a commodity like shampoo, for example, that yes, uh, 
uh, if I'm predicting the price of shampoo, uh, shampoos are highly commoditized and they are not as experienced and personalized as an Airbnb listing. So, you know, you have to think of those perspectives of when NLP is really adding value. And the other piece of, uh, you know, I like to think of is what is the, pro how will you improve the depth or the scale of the work you're doing? So you can use NLP or uh, to help increase the, the amount of uh, insights generation you are doing or prediction you are doing because you're now suddenly able to like deal with hundreds and thousands of more texts or you are improving the quality of the insight because if you are not doing either or um then what is the what is the the incremental on regular human insights or not building a model using nlp so always think of that incremental both from a business but also from the depth or the scale of the work you're doing like are you adding to efficiencies production increase in the speed of production of your work or you are adding additional depth to the quality of the work that you're doing. And you know, how do you get started? I think there are lots of ways you can get started doing, uh, you know, jolting into a course and doing a webinar and getting sure that, you know, you got the head start is obviously a great starting point. Um, but when you, you know, you keep learning more, you understand the differences on what you are learning for. Are you learning for doing research? Uh, in the field of academics or you're doing it for the industry and you're doing applied NLP. I think understanding those differences and prepping yourself to uh, to serve those differences would be a big thing. I also feel like when people start on a new journey like uh, you know machine learning or any complex topic like this, you want to not just do, but you also want to reflect and write. So I would highly recommend that whatever you do, you either explain it to other people or you blog and you know you start your own meet and blog to communicate and strengthen your approach and methodology. Because the more you write about what you do, the better you become at explaining it to others. And, and if you go back to the beginning of my presentation, I think being able to explain and being able to answer people's question takes it way forward than what you would do not doing it. So I think that's super important. Um, and you know, don't don't wait for getting into a job. Don't wait for giving somebody giving you a data set. There is so much data out there. I would recommend practicing with public data sets, building a portfolio for yourself. The the information I can see some of the questions here. I think the projects that have been given in the series um, is a really really robust portfolio for you to build. So if you just get started with this, I think um, it is going to take you a long way. Or, uh, you know, sometimes I often say that, uh, why don't you just go and uh, download a bunch of Twitter posts or Amazon reviews and start building a model for yourself? I think, and if you highlight that in your job, that this is the bottom, this is what we found out, you know, and if you share your collab notebook or your Jupyter notebook with your uh, recruiter or your uh, hiring manager, um, you know, they'll be highly, highly impressed because you'll be surprised to know how many people do not know how to do it or even the stuff that you know um, you have gone through in this series. And the last piece is you know, managing expectations and value that you add in your day-to-day -day work um, because there are many, many dangers of entering into the world of applied NLP. There are confused stakeholders, things that you cannot explain or interpret. Data is not good or data is too little, so there's low volumes. People are expecting too much because everybody wants to solve and go to the moon and uh, you know I, as i said repeated requests for sentiment analysis and sentiment analysis is not easy uh, not even so useful to be honest so that's all and you know i've just left you all with the best practice checklist uh, this is more about when you are getting into a job and you're trying to create a project how would you go about identifying the objectives creating a standard taxonomy building your goal data sets uh, and determining if there is a need to develop uh, you know, more advanced things or it is more uh, simple on the spectrum of NLP. So yeah, I mean, that's all I had. I'm so happy to uh, you know, be speaking to you all. Uh, I can be found on this LinkedIn. Uh, please feel free to send me a connection. I also teach at NYU, so if some of you are students, um, more than happy to connect from an NYU perspective. And uh, I really appreciate the work that the team has done and uh, 
having us get this moment to talk about the industry applications uh, after you have gone through a series of five rigorous webinars. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll pause there for any questions and I'm just looking at the questions now. Let me stop sharing. There is a question, Richka. Do you feel working on projects given the series? Yeah, I did kind of answer that. I think it's a really good starting point. I will highly recommend starting here and then going and you know looking at uh, more data sets. And also, I think you have to you have to write about what you do. If you do not reflect and log it out, I I feel like. The learnings just get lost. So if you're if you're new to an new to a topic, find a way of expressing it, whether to a group of people, uh, you know, doing free webinars or recording videos or even writing about it. I think that's a great thing to do. What are some of the good? Um, yeah, I think good public data sets. Kaggle is a good one. The UCLA machine learning repository is very good. NYC.gov has very good data, but I think it doesn't have a lot of uh, text data. Um, so just uh, just a lot out there. Somebody's asking for a portfolio. Uh, should we be using? I think it depends, like people want to see a end outcome where, you know, I think in your portfolio, your GitHub profile matters a lot. So that uh, you can, you know, if you are able to deploy something and build, uh, you know, build like a visual visualizer or something, I think that goes a long, long way, but it really depends on how much time you have and what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I would say that having a portfolio A helps and having a more profound portfolio with uh, a, having a deployed web version is is the more the better. I think personally, the challenge with sentiments is the way people express themselves is so layered when they're trying to write about an, an experience or about a product that, you know, sometimes your sentiments get neutralized. And half of the times when I'm using social analytics tools, for example, your sentiments are mostly going to be neutral. And uh, the positive, and even for the comments that are, you know, flagged as positive sentiments, when you're going to start reading them, uh, you will find a huge variance, variance in terms of somebody who uses very positive words, but then quickly switches into a really negative uh, monologue about the product. So I find that the action that you can take on sentiments is is much lesser than the action you can take on the actual topics that people are talking about. So if you're able to A, find those topics and do that kind of uh, topic classification is very useful. Or if you connect it with more uh, you know, continuous data or numerical quantitative data and do some kind of predictive um, work using the text data that I also find it super useful. Okay. Um... So somebody is asking that, you know, as a data scientist, I feel there will be no more coding in future and how many tools are replacing data scientists. Um, do we need to now focus on AI application like robotics or something? Um, I think some Rishika is already trying to answer that question, but uh, to be, you know, just giving another perspective, I think, yes, there will be a lot of, lot of automation involved. So you need to choose whether you want to get into 
you know, a core engineering job where you, you, you basically are at the other end of the spectrum or you want to be more applications oriented. And depending on what you really want to do, I think that's, uh, that's going to decide what you will focus on in the future. Uh, but, you know, Rishika, feel free to add any additional um, thoughts on that. A, a very basic NLP project to start with, as I'm telling you all, just take a bunch of text information, whether it is uh, Airbnb. If you actually go to Kaggle and you just look for text data, you're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of different kind of uh, data sets. So either you you build a model like you guys did in this webinar where you are predicting something using a, uh, a classification model or you just do, uh, you know, you start with basic stuff of finding uh, topics or doing cluster analysis on the on the different topics and themes. Uh, how do we how do you do that? And I think just knowing and navigating through all of that steps of data manipulation and building something simple is a very good place to get started. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just pause here and um, Sumana, I'm gonna hand it over to you if there's anything you would like to add. Hey, Ruchika, I still see a bunch of questions that are um, there in the Q&A. Um, do you see them on your end? Oh, okay, let me see. So somebody is asking me, um, machine learning and data science aren't established in some countries as a result. In such countries, there's no data science jobs. How would you help NLP enthusiasts from such countries grow? So I think, um, you know, doing academic uh, projects uh, is always a good place to start. So doing courses and then applying them in, in your little skunk projects, like you don't, it doesn't, you don't have to do a NLP or any machine learning project uh, for your job. You can just pick any topic, anything that interests you and go and do it. So for example, if you're interested in uh, what, uh, you know, what kind of data that, that, that exists uh, on UN. So if you go to UN, you'll find multitudes of data that you have, which you can do build models on. And there's a lot of data that is also textual in nature. nature. So I think you just have to start, um, start from there. And the uh, create a community around you who are interested in the same things. So that is why I feel like as an enthusiast who is either beginning their career or, you know, deep into the career, but want to evolve into learning more about NLP, uh, you have to, you have to find a place to express yourself and build a community around it. So if, if you can, you know, my first steps would be like writing a blog about it, sharing it on your LinkedIn profile, uh, sharing it within your uh, student group, sharing it with your professors or with your companies. And, hey, I'm interested. I did this little project. This is the finding. Uh, how can we take it forward? So you you may not be able to see what uh, what entails in taking it to the next level, but somebody you presented it to or somebody you shared it to uh, can see the value in it and can um, can take it up. All right, let me see any all other open questions. Somebody is asking me if having a data engineer industry experience uh, get a job in machine learning NLP? Is it difficult to secure a job in this scenario? Any kind of suggestion would be of great help. I think, um, you know, you have to think about 
what domain you're going to apply your skills into. Uh, so for me, for example, I'm, I'm a marketing data expert. So this, apart from knowing, you know, how to build a predictive model, how to do machine learning or how to do unsupervised learning, I also know how to deal with media landscape in terms of what kind of data comes, why is this data important? So I would say that having your tools and NLP experience is great, but also having a, a domain experience helps. Like, are you a tech, technology person? Have you worked in technology? Have you worked in finance? Have you worked in insurance? Because that just adds additional layer of qualification that gets you uh, in front of uh, your hiring manager versus some other people who have just learned NLP and just going to get a job. Uh, not to say that there are not jobs, but I think it just makes the process more easier and you will add more value. And I think some, somebody again asked a similar question um, with uh, somebody with a software engineering background, basic knowledge in AI and NLP. I think the jobs are uh, depending on what kind of software you're building. Uh, you know, if you, if you have to pivot to AI and NLP, you just have to do some of your portfolio building and then you can definitely apply for the jobs that you're interested in. I, can you share an interesting project you worked on? I think I have worked a lot with, uh, with reviews in my life, with social text classification, uh, also using uh, text data to predict uh, sale values, uh, prices. Uh, that's the kind of I have, I have done. Could you send, send us some links why, where we could apply into PhD? Um, you know, I have not looked into it uh, as I haven't looked into doing PhD so far. Uh, but I'm sure we can uh, try and give you something uh, if the team has anything. Then the last, somebody asked about the last slide, you had best practice checklist, can you go through it? I think uh, it's one of the white papers that I, I found on, on SAS, the website, um, but really it talks, it, it cap it captures a lot that we we talked about in terms of um, you know articulating the objective of what you are trying to solve for, um, making sure that your technical and business users are aligned on goals and requirements because you don't want a uh, scenario where people are expecting the moon and you know you end up with something really simplistic because the data was not enough or the data had really bad quality. Um, you know, understanding what is the regulatory guidance, like whether it is CCPA, GDPR, like there's so much privacy and guidance on what kind of data you, use, you, you can use. For example, I, I recall that at one point we wanted to talk about, uh, we wanted to understand the conversations happening uh, within uh, the customer chats of a company. So we were trying to understand like what kind of questions people ask uh, when they're making a purchase decision, but we realized and we were told that you cannot really uh, use the customer chats because uh, not that first they're encrypted, like they could be, uh, they, they are not, uh, they don't remove the personal information from, from the information that is being recorded. So we were not able to use it. So just knowing that what kind of guidance uh, and permissions are there will help you not go too deep into it and come back because, oh, there's a, a regulation guidance, uh, creating a standard taxonomy of the data set. Um, so taxonomies are just like, when you think of, uh, you know, you think of text data, unless you have a taxonomy of what you are trying to do, like, are you trying to categorize some things into different um, um, groups? So just having a taxonomy is uh, important providing provide a data set for those items in the taxonomy that you want to measure for accuracy. Um, and then I think the, the most important thing is how do you understand um, if there's a need to leverage deep learning or any kind of uh, you know advanced machine learning. So is the problem big enough to solve it like that? And again, think of your scale and depth framework of whether this is able to drive more efficiency or speed up the process, or um, it is not required because you don't want to dig unnecessarily so deep and spend so much time when the output will not be incremental in terms of value. And I'm happy to just send you that PDF because I did uh, download it. So let me just see if it's available.
And there is a question about, I have a research for my thesis about five determinants that could appear on reports. I shown differentiation in terms of their personality. I think this is a very specific question. I don't know if we can answer this on chat, but if you, you know, if you want to share what exactly you are trying to do, uh, we can definitely take a shot at helping you out. I want to pursue my career as an AI. Should I go after, like, should, what should be? I think we, we are, we are, it's the same thing. You figure out if you want to get into academics or you want to get into business. And if you want to become a researcher, I think, you know, you might consider formal education first and, you know, do some kind of a course in it, um, like maybe a one month, one year program. Um, you know, you can also test out what is by just doing some MOOC courses and then figuring out whether you really want to get a degree. And, you know, that's how you get into it. Like there is no easy way to become a researcher, I would say. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. And <coughs> I'm gonna just quickly get the link to the PDF that I use for best practices. And put it here in the chat. Okay, so I think we have answered most questions. Well, hopefully uh, this was useful to you. Uh, I also am very open to connecting on LinkedIn and talking about anything uh, which is related to data science, marketing science, um, you know, getting any mentoring on kind of jobs you're looking for. If something, this is an area that interests you. Um, I just love talking to people who are interested in my field. So happy to connect and continue the conversation. And thank you, Sumana and the team for giving me this opportunity to discuss. Thank you so much for that amazing session, Ruchika. Um, please give us a thumbs up, thumbs down in the chat, all the participants to show your appreciation for uh, the amazing insights that Ruchika has shared in this session. Um, I'm gonna share some more information in the chat um, on how to get in touch with Rushika, how to get in touch with our team and um, what, what events we have coming up. Do take a look at the links that I've shared uh, with you all. Thank you everyone for um, joining us for this six week journey into NLP. I hope this was helpful for you and we were able to give you the insights you needed to get you kick started into this field. Um, thank you again for joining and thank you so much again, Ruchika, for sharing your insights with our community. Uh, we really appreciate it. Same here. Thank you so much. Great opportunity. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. See you all soon in the next sessions.